It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this side of the House has spent months trying to get to the bottom of just how widespread the alleged corruption which the RCMP is investigating goes. Public accounts revealed that the Premier's former Principal Secretary, Amin Masoudi, after leaving the Premier's office, was paid nearly a quarter of a million dollars to do the same job, only this time through his private company, Atlas. Yet this government has refused to answer questions on just exactly when that contract started. My question is to the Premier. When did the contract with Atlas Strategic Advisors start with the Conservative Caucus? To respond, the government house leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the question. Uh, as the leader of the opposition highlighted, uh, this is something that was in the public accounts of uh, the province. It is not a, a secret or something that uh, was uh, hidden, just the opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, uh, we are continuing to focus on those things that matter to the people of the province of Ontario, that is creating jobs. Uh, building more homes, Mr. Speaker. We are seeing uh, uh, really extraordinary results across the province of Ontario. Some 700,000 people have the dignity of a job that didn't have that uh, when, we, when we came to office, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue on that path of building more jobs, a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario for the people of the province. Supplementary question. Well, uh, well Speaker, let me, let me help uh, the Premier out here again. We understand that Mr. Masoudi is no longer employed with the Conservative Caucus. Shortly after the news broke of the Vegas boys' trip, this government quietly ended the contract. What they won't answer to this House, Speaker, is when the contract started. The Premier's office told the Toronto Star that this government paid Mr. Masoudi's firm at least $237.13. $1,300 from about July 1, 2022 through to March 31st of this year. So back to the Premier. Can he confirm that the contract with Atlas Strategic Advisors started in July 2022? Uh, Speaker, look, uh, Mr. Masudi uh, has a, had a contract with uh, PCCS, as do a number of others who provide services for PCCS and uh, all of the caucuses, uh, or the recognized caucuses here, including uh, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, uh, Speaker. But at the same time, we're going to continue to do what is important, focusing on creating jobs in the province of Ontario, building a strong, uh, uh, strong economy, and really doubling down on ensuring that we can build more homes across Ontario. I'm very glad to see today that uh, the Mayor of St. Thomas is here. That is a mayor who has un undertaken extraordinary work to remove obstacles so that we could bring a massive amount of jobs to his community so that we can build homes, economic growth, Mr. Speaker. That is the type of leadership that we need across the province of Ontario from our municipal partners. I'm really happy that his worship is here. We will continue to work with Mayor uh, Preston so that we can ensure Response? that not only St. Thomas but all parts of, uh, of Ontario can experience the exact same growth that they're going to have in St. Thomas. St. Thomas, thousands of jobs, economic growth. It's good for the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I can understand uh, why this Premier would want to avoid the question. New documents that the NDP official opposition have obtained show that Mr. Masoudi left his role as Principal Secretary on August 27, 2022, months, months after this government told the Toronto Star they were paying his private company to provide the exact same services. So, Speaker, did the Premier's friend double bill the taxpayers for speech writing services because he was indeed a close friend of the Premier? No, Mr. Speaker. Now, the next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Yes. That's interesting. Speaker, this question is also for the Premier, and, uh, and that's not going to cut it, Premier, uh, Speaker, by the way. That is not going Order. to cut it. These are, these are important questions, and the people of this province deserve answers from this government. So, Speaker, this, ans this, uh, this question is also for the Premier. While our public services like health care and schools are crumbling across this province and housing is getting more and more out of reach, somehow this government brags about spending more than ever. So to the Premier, 
People who are stuck in longer and longer waits in the emergency room or being treated in hospitals, uh, hallways, want to know where is the money going. Reply, the Premier. Well, I'll tell the Leader of the Opposition where the, where the money's going. Since we've been in office, Mr. Speaker, we've registered over 63,000 nurses. Last year was a record over 15,000 nurses, and there's 30,000 in the hopper, Mr. Order. Speaker. But they voted against that legislation. They voted against building a new medical Order. university yeah. up in Peel. Yep. They voted against that. Matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, our backlog surgeries have dropped by 25,000 patients. Well, they vote against that as well. They vote against building 50 new or additions to hospitals across the province to a tune of $50 billion. Mr. Speaker, they voted against that as well. They don't believe in fixing the health care system. What they believe Order. is the status quo under the previous two governments, the Liberals and propped up by the NDP, Response. not spending. Matter of fact, they fired nurses under when they were working together. We're hiring thousands and thousands of nurses. That's what we're doing with the health care dollars. Yeah. Waterloo, come to order. The member for Brantford, Brant, come to order. Supplementary question. I'll help the Premier. You know where the money's going? It's going directly out of the public coffers and into their friends' private pockets. That's where it's going. This is a government that continues to spend more for less. New data shows that the private surgical clinics this government was so keen on expanding are charging OHIP 138 per cent more for the same surgery. It's also making wait times longer, all while public operating rooms sit with the lights off. So back to the Premier. When will this government admit that their private for profit surgery scheme is increasing the cost of taxpayers and worsening wait times? The Premier. You know something, Mr. Speaker? You talk to anyone that's waiting for a year or two years for hip replacement, a knee replacement, or cataracts. You know, cataracts. They did 14,000 cataract surgeries, taking the burden off the hospitals. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? It was all paid by the old hip card, not by their credit card. We're continuing building on, on 19 common ailments, resulting in 530,000 assessments less every single year, taking the burden off the family docs, taking the burden off people going in and waiting, waiting in, a, in a doctor's office for over an hour to get the appointment. Now they can go to the local pharmacy, making sure they have convenient care closer to home. That's what we're doing Response. with the health care system. The final supplementary. Speaker, at four times the cost of what they could be paying in the public health care system. Speaker, public operating rooms sitting empty, emergency rooms closing, affordable housing wait lists decades long, more people with full-time jobs going to food banks than ever before. All while this government has been so preoccupied with their shady backroom deals, spending more for less in health care, $650 million, Speaker, on a private luxury spa, hoarding billions in their rainy day fund, all while Ontarians are struggling. So back to the Premier. Five years in, people are worse off now than before. The rainy day is here. When will this government finally invest to make life easier for Ontarians? Members, will please take your seats. I'm going to caution the Leader of the Opposition on the, her choice of words. The Premier can re respond. Oh, m Mr. Speaker, I, I find it so ironic. We walked in, I describe it as a bankrupt company. Every single ministry was an absolute disaster. The health care system was just in full collapse until we came on board. And what are we doing for the people of Ontario? We're putting more money into people's pockets. Under their reign, there was 300,000 jobs lost. In this province, there's over 700,000 more people taking home a paycheck, being able to pay rent or pay a, pay a mortgage. We reduced, Mr. Speaker, we got rid of the tolls on the 412. 
418. We eliminated that sticker tax. We redu reduced the gas tax by 10 cents a litre. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? They voted against Order. every single item that we did. They don't believe in saving taxpayers' money. They Order. believe in gouging the taxpayers for every penny they have. All three Fox. of these parties, they believe in tax, tax, tax. Order. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the crisis in our post-secondary system provides yet another example of a public service that is crumbling under this government's erratic and irresponsible fiscal approach. Last week's Blue Ribbon Panel found that Ontario's funding for post-secondary education is just half that of the rest of Canada. Eight Ontario universities have run deficits for two years in a row. Speaker, what is the Premier's plan to address the fragile and financially unsustainable situation of Ontario's colleges and universities. The Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the member, for that question. And, Speaker, the opposition can ask questions until they're blue in the face, but my answer is still the same. We are reviewing the panel's recommendations, and we will look forward to working with the sector and to develop a plan that works for the long-term sustainability and success for Ontario's colleges and universities. But I want to remind everyone that the NDPs under the Liberal government let tuition skyrocket in this province. Yes. But now that a government is taking a practical approach, putting students first and taking the time to review the recommendations, they don't want to be part of our solution. Like always, they will oppose the measures that we take to support students. They'll vote against the solutions that we bring forward and fo focus on playing politics. We are here to support students and to Spons. ensure financial sustainability of the post-secondary institutions for years to come. Supplementary question. Speaker, this government has slashed funding for post-secondary education, both on a per-student basis and operating uh, funding. More and more institutions are being forced to turn to partnerships with private, for-profit colleges to keep the doors open, which raises questions if this was the government's plan all along. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to ensuring that colleges and universities in Ontario will get the increased funding that they, and more importantly, Importantly, students need to keep the sector afloat. Members, please take their seats. To reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I cannot overemphasize the importance of ensuring that colleges and universities operate transparently and are accountable to students and the taxpayers about how Order. their money is spent. My ministry has already begun working with institutions on a financial accountability framework that will allow for early detection of financial challenges and require immediate action to, rec to correct bad practices. In order for post-secondary to be uh, sustainable for the long term, institutions need to take leadership and review their operations from top to bottom, from governance practices, program offerings, day-to-day -day operations and everything between. Colleges and universities across this province need to become the best possible version of themselves. This is not a change that will happen overnight, but it is one that is necessary so that students, families and taxpayers can have confidence that every Order. dollar being spent is allocated Spons. appropriately and with complete transparency. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Great Minister. Just last week, Speaker, a Liberal member in this House said that the federal carbon tax was making life better for the people of Ontario. That could not be further from the truth. I would encourage that member to stop parroting talking points from the Prime Minister's office and Ontario Liberal leadership candidates and start talking to her constituents and businesses who are struggling because of this terrible tax. Our government understands that businesses have had a lot to deal with over the last few years, which is why we have been so steadfast in our commitment to lowering costs and persistent in our opposition to the federal government's carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please Question. highlight 
what our government has done to lower costs for businesses across the province of Ontario. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Well, while the Liberal government has been busy raising taxes and raising the burden on businesses, we've been busy, and this Premier Ford's government, cutting red tape. In fact, we've cut over 500 pieces of red tape that save over $900 million dollars of burden on businesses each and every year. Speaker, we have lowered the workers' compensation by 50 percent without touching the workers' benefits. This is a savings of $2.5 billion each and every year. We allow companies now to write off their new equipment in year. saves them a $1 billion a year. This has all put a package together of saving $8 billion a year, put 700,000 people to work while they're busy with a carbon tax that penalizes business. We are continuing to lower costs and putting people to work. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Our government understands the challenges that businesses are facing with high inflation and high interest rates, and that's why we have taken concrete actions to lower costs, as the minister outlined. At the same time, we recognize the importance of tackling climate change. But you don't address climate change by penalizing businesses and the hardworking people of this province with a carbon tax. Uh, Speaker, can the minister please outline how, unlike the federal government, we have been able to lower costs for our businesses while treating climate change seriously? Thank you. <clears throat> Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we have lowered the cost of business by $8 billion a year. That has attracted $27 billion of electric vehicle investments. 120,000 men and women are working in that sector. Speaker, that is going to produce here in Ontario. We saw General Motors have the first electric vehicles in Canadian history come off their assembly line in Ingersoll. We are producing clean, emission-free vehicles here in Ontario, Speaker. This is built with, these are built with Ontario workers right here in our province. Our batteries will be 100 per cent clean energy. You get a battery in Kentucky made with 6% clean energy, or go to Indiana, get a battery with 7% clean energy. Here in Ontario, we are making Response. green steel, which will produce zero-emission vehicles. Speaker, That's what we're doing in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, this government is planning to allow only one hour of committee hearings to discuss Bill 136, the Greenbelt Statute Law Amendment Act, and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing intends to use up that entire hour. Ontarians are rightfully outraged by this government's actions on the Greenbelt, so why are you blocking the public from being heard? Okay. Government House Leader. I don't know, Speaker. I think I'm a pretty entertaining guy when I get up there. I think I, I, think I add value to the hearings. I think uh, that the members opposite would want to hear from, uh, from uh, cabinet ministers. In fact, it was this government that uh, made it mandatory for cabinet ministers to actually appear before committees to defend their bills. Speaker. I want to thank the Premier for insisting that we do that. But when it comes to the Greenbelt Statute Amendment Act, Mr. Speaker, look, we've made it very clear. We made a public policy decision that wasn't supported by the people of the province of Ontario. The opposition, I assume, is going to vote in favour of, uh, of that repeal, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, it is still uh, uh, on the environmental registry uh, uh, for, uh, for a 30-day consultation from, uh, from people, from Indigenous communities, uh, Speaker. There is ample opportunity for the public to participate, to have their say. That will all be framed uh, in, uh, as part of the committee here, uh, uh, Speaker, before this House uh, votes on, uh, on third reading. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. You know what? In Ontario, we've heard enough from cabinet ministers. We need to hear from the public. That's what we need in this province. And this the second biggest parcel of land removed from the Greenbelt was located in Hamilton. The Integrity Commissioner reported details about how favoured Greenbelt developers in Hamilton received preferential treatment from this government. The Premier repeatedly called one of these speculators, and the PC Party's fundraising chair sold this speculator tickets to the Premier's daughter, Stag and Doe. 
Why is the government blocking the public from participating in the Bill 136 hearings? Is it possibly to avoid accountability for preferential treatment of the Premier's special Greenbelt friends? Premier. Well, to answer the opposition's question, she said, we need to hear from the public. Do you know why you aren't hearing from the public? They don't give two hoots about that. I'll tell you what they care about. They care about their interest rates going up. They care about affordable homes, that they block every single vote we have to make things easier and more affordable homes. They worry about the next year or two when their interest rates get jacked up and all of a sudden they're paying three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 more a month. That's what they care about. The number one issue on every poll, independent, other polls, is number one, bar none, is making sure their gas is affordable, hoping that the federal government will take the 14 cents of the, of the carbon tax off a litre of gas. They care about having affordable groceries, and they care about having Spons. an affordable home. Second, Mr. Speaker, in any poll, it's the economy, making sure that they have a stable job to ensure that they have an income to buy that house. To pay that Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Premier will take a seat. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Just last week, the Liberal member for Canada Carleton said that the vast majority of Ontario households are better off with a carbon price. However, a report by the Parliamentary Budget Officer, or PBO, provides further evidence that calls her statement into question. The PBO concludes that most households will experience a net loss of income from the disastrous federal carbon tax when accounting for both direct and indirect costs. Specifically, the PBO report finds that 60 per cent of households in Alberta, Ontario, Saskatchewan and Manitoba will pay more in carbon taxes than they receive in rebates. Speaker, through you, can the Minister of Finance please provide his views regarding the impact of the disastrous carbon tax on Ontario families? Thank you. To respond, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Carleton. Mr. Speaker, I want to be crystal clear to the people of Ontario, to the federal government, especially to the Liberal member from Kanata Carleton. The federal ta carbon tax is making life tougher and making all areas of life more expensive for the people of Ontario and their families, Mr. Speaker. It makes the commute to the grocery store pricier, and it, once there, it makes the price of food more expensive, even for the member of the leader of the independent party over there. Mr. Speaker, this isn't a tax that just affects some Ontarians. This is driving up costs for every person in the province and across the country. That is why we will not stop putting pressure on the Liberal government to do the right thing, and perhaps the provincial party will join and eliminate Response. this regressive carbon tax. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. The Parliamentary Budget Officer further states that by 2030, 80 per cent of Ontario households will actually be worse off, not better, because of the carbon tax. And it's concerning that while you are answering your question, I was hearing the Liberal members in the back corner disagreeing with you and saying that people are still going to be better off with the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, overall, on average, Ontarians will pay $478 more per household because of the federal carbon tax. And in the year 2030, the average financial loss for Ontarians will be close to $2,000 per household. Increasing the carbon tax will only negatively impact Ontario families and our economy not improve it, despite what the Liberals might think. The carbon tax adversely affects our businesses and negatively impacts our economy and Ontario workers. Speaker, to you, can the minister please set the record straight about how the carbon tax hurts all sectors of Ontario's economy? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, to the hardworking member from uh, Carleton. You know, the Liberal member from Canada, Carleton, might think that more taxes and higher prices are good for the people of Ontario, but this government is taking action to put money back into the pockets of many Ontarians. While we wait for the federal government to end the carbon tax, our new measures are giving relief to families right across the province. That's why, Mr. Speaker, 
Only a few weeks ago, we attended, extended the gas tax cut to June 2024, ensuring that drivers continue to have the relief they need at the pumps. Mr. Speaker, we ended the license plate stickers, making it more affordable to drive your car, reducing electricity bills, cutting tolls on the 412 and the 418. This government will continue to lead the way, making life more affordable Spons. for the people of Ontario, and perhaps the members opposite would join us in doing just the same. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. In September, the Premier claimed that teachers and school boards were indoctrinating children about gender identity. Words matter, especially those spoken by the Premier. Today is the Trans Day of Remembrance, and this House held a moment of silence to remember those who died or were killed because of transphobic hatred and violence. Since the Premier made that damaging claim, incidents of hate directed at trans and queer people, and especially students, have been rising dramatically. My question is, does the Premier regret his claim when he knows that the only curriculum being taught in Ontario is the one posted on the Ministry of Education's own website? Reply. I recognize the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, uh, I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member uh, for that important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's no question that Ontario is home uh, to a strong and vibrant 2S LGBTQIA community uh, and that call Ontario home. We recognize the unique challenges and barriers faced by many within the community. Mr. Speaker, that is why we are making critical investments to build safer and more secure communities in all aspects. This includes over $60 million in anti-hate initiatives just from my ministry alone, including a $25.5 million investment on the anti-hate security and prevention grant. Mr. Speaker, as we observe the Transgender Day of Remembrance, we remember the historical and ongoing challenges faced by the community and commit to building a stronger, more inclusive province where all Ontarians can safely and freely express their identity, practice their faith, Response. and observe their traditions. Speaker, empty words that don't actually keep don't actually keep trans communities safe. Hate crimes are on the rise in Ontario, and in Toronto, we have seen this tri tripled in the 2S LGBT community. In fact, according to Toronto Police, queer and trans people are the ones most frequently victimized by physical assault. In April, I introduced an NDP bill to address this violence by creating the first ever Ontario-wide strategy to address 2S LGBTQI safety. Every day that goes by without a provincial plan to stop transphobic violence, the community grows more afraid and is losing hope. Can the Premier, can anyone in government assure the trans and queer can assure that trans and queer families like mine that they will keep us safe. How will he commit to working with us to pass this legislation as soon as possible? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I have said from day one, my door is always open and it will continue to stay open to all members of any community. During my time as Minister, I have had ongoing discussions with many members of Ontario's 2S LGBTQIA community and organizations, including Pride Toronto and the 519, who is just down the street, to learn more about the work they do and how best we can support them. These conversations have inspired the $4.8 million investment to 82 community-led projects that increase public education, awareness, and understanding of the impacts of racism and hate, just to name another initiative alone. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, I want to say, in light of today being Transgender Day of Remembrance, Response. that to anyone who has experienced discrimination, harassment, or is struggling, please know that you are valued and that you are not alone. We are here for you and our government will continue building a stronger and more inclusive Ontario where all people feel safe and accepted. Thank you. Stop the clock. Thank you very much. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Scarborough-Guildwood. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. This government loves to talk about investing in transit, but under their watch, transit agencies are more underfunded than ever. What good is a new subway line if the other subway lines and bus routes are getting cut because the TTC is starved for funding and government wouldn't pay up? Our economy relies on public transit, getting our workers to work on time. Transit agencies are cutting routes while increasing fares. Reduced service is a major obstacle to bringing people back on the TTC, where we are only at 78% of pre-pandemic usage. The TTC does not have the money to restore service, and we need the province to step up. The provincial subsidy for transit agencies is not tied to inflation. Will the minister commit to funding transit service that Ontarians rely on, or will they Question. continue treating bus riders as an afterthought? Government House Leader. I mean, that's a, a very, very interesting question coming from a Liberal member from, uh, from Scarborough. The member will, of course, remember that the previous Liberal government absolutely did nothing when it came to supporting transit and transportation in Scarborough. Uh, speaker, not only are we building a subway in Scarborough, the Ontario line, but we're also doing more on the go, on go services across, uh, not only into that area, but across the GTA. In my own riding, two-way all-day go train, something we could have only dreamed of before. It is now a reality in uh, many parts. Many parts of the province. We are putting historic levels of funding, historic levels of funding to support our transit and, uh, and transportation, including our public transportation system. Uh, speaker, there is no government that has put more money into public transportation than this government, and we will continue on that Spons. because we understand how important it is to building a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And we'll continue to do the work that the Liberals refuse to do when they have that opportunity. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, under this government's watch, an LRT derailed in Scarborough, and we have seen no accountability from the Conservatives, no apology, no commitment to fund the replacement busway that is urgently needed. Having witnessed one LRT line derailed because of poor maintenance, I would hope that this government would see it as a warning that they need to invest in the system, but instead the TTC has to cancel buying new trains for Line 2 because of their provincially supported funding crisis. The trains on Line 2 are not built to last past 2026, and thousands of commuters and I are worried that a serious accident might occur once again. We need to buy new trains, and this government needs to step up because the TTC cannot afford it alone. Alone. Will the minister commit to helping Toronto replace the trains, or he content to watch another subway derail under his government's watch? Speaker, as you know, the Liberals voted against the $70 billion increase in funding for transit. Uh, they voted against that. We provided historic levels of funding under the Safe Restart yep. program. But look, the member is right on one thing. It is time to make investments. But you know when it was time to start making investments? Yeah. 10, 12 years ago when the people of Scarborough, when the people of Toronto were desperate for more subways and the Liberals did absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker. Now, as in every single thing that this government has to do, it is about catching up yep. because after after 15 years of disastrous Liberal and NDP-supported rule, we are faced with crises, whether it's in transit and transportation, our health care system, so we've had to build hospitals, renew our hospitals, build long-term care, build more roads, improve our transit uh, system. We're building subways, Mr. Speaker. You know why we have to do all of that? Because under 15 years of Liberals, they did absolutely nothing. They spent, but we have no idea what they spent on. They have nothing to show for it other than high taxes, high High regulations and being one of the most indebted sub-sovereign governments in the world. We're getting it done and we'll continue to get it done for all of the people of Toronto and Ontario. Next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Speaker, we've heard in this House, and we've certainly heard from our constituents, that the carbon tax is making everything more expensive for all Ontarians. But the people of Northern Ontario and the Northern Indigenous communities are even more impacted by the high cost of goods and travel because of this regressive tax. That's why it's so shocking to hear the Liberal and NDP opposition members continuing to defend the tax. Mm -hmm. The reality is that the cost of transporting goods is already much higher in Northern Ontario, and these costs are being passed on to the consumers. 
Speaker, will the minister please elaborate on his views regarding the carbon tax's negative impact on Northern Ontario and Northern Indigenous communities? Question. To reply, the Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My good friend, the member of, uh, for Kiewetnung over there, often discusses the price differences between groceries and other commodities between uh, more populated communities uh, in the north. Uh, Sioux Lookout uh, to, to Sandy Lake, First Nation, was an example he gave, and he noted that the price of chicken is sometimes six times higher in Sandy Lake, First Nation, than it is in Sioux Lookout, and I would argue it's already more expensive in Sioux Lookout than it is in other big towns and cities. Well, the Auditor General, he chimed in, uh, chimed in on this in 2022, said uh, Indigenous groups are disproportionately burdened by car carbon pricing. This is before you factor in the harsh impacts of inflation disproportionately felt in remote communities and only being made worse by the carbon tax. Now, I know he was in Sachigo Lake this weekend, I think it was. I wondered if he noticed that gas was well above $2 a litre and bread was $4 uh, a loaf, Mr. Speaker. Is he going to stand with us, Mr. Speaker, and to vote to scrap this tax? Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for those examples of this outrageousness. The carbon tax is, in essence, tax on everything. Your groceries, your gas, your home heating fuel, so much more. It's outrageous that the federal government is imposing this regressive tax that negative, negatively impacts individuals and families, especially those in northern communities. Instead of supporting northern Ontario, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, spent more time insulting the region, calling it no man's land. Mm. Unlike other parts of our province, the North faces unique barriers regarding fuel costs that need to be understood and respected. Individuals downplaying the carbon tax's impact on Northern Ontario is ultimately disrespectful to all of its residents. Mm -hmm. Speaker, will the minister please elabor elaborate on the detrimental impacts of the carbon tax of the people, the communities, and the businesses Question. across the North? Good job. Minister of Northern Development. All day long, Mr. Speaker, take the member from Orleans who talks about how if everyone just got a heat pump and used electricity to power their homes, why they'd be better off. Is the member from Orleans not aware that dozens of remote and isolated communities rely on diesel fuel and that heat pumps in places like Kenora don't actually work when temperatures move beyond minus 20, something that's going to be happening very quickly. We're hard at work to make sure that our northern remote and isolated communities, Mr. Speaker, have affordable, clean uh, energy. But it turns out that old St. Uh, Justin gave us a lump of coal, Mr. Speaker, during this holiday season. It was only the folks from Atlantic Canada who got relief from that carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We moved off coal under the leadership of Michael Harris and Premier Harris and other successive governments. We Response. don't want coal, Mr. Speaker. We need to scrap the carbon tax. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, we learned the Conservative government is paying private for profit clinics two to four times more than they pay public hospitals for OAP covered surgeries. Also, the former Minister of Health is now lobbying for Clearpoint Health, wow. the biggest chain of private surgical clinics in the country. This comes as a recent reports that noted that expanding private surgery will not, will not reduce wait times. In fact, it will increase wait times for patients while worsening our staffing prices in the province of Ontario. Speaker, why is the Premier choosing to put profits for private clinics before care for patients in the province of Ontario? To respond, the member for Eglinton Lawrence and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I haven't seen the study that you referred to. I'll look at it, but I don't understand how completing 14,000 extra cataract surgeries in the last year will not reduce wait times. It seems to me that that reduced wait times. Every 
reduced wait times for actually 14,000 people who had those cataract surgeries, who can now read to their grandchildren, who can now drive to the store, who can now get about their daily lives. And thank goodness we did that because people need to get back to their lives. And that is what this government is doing, making sure we have the right care in the right place at the right time, paid for with your OHIP card. Well, it's unfortunate that you hadn't seen the report. It came out five days ago. I give you plenty of time to read it. Yeah. <laughs> Back to the Premier. This isn't the first time a Conservative government in Ontario privatized public care. The Mike Harris Conservatives did it with long-term care. They closed 26 hospitals and laid off 6,000 nurses. 6,000 people have died in long-term care during the pandemic. 78 yep. percent were in private for-profit clinics. The military was called in for some of those homes. Some residents were dying of dehydration. The Premier then gifted those homes with legal protection so families couldn't sue them for neglect. And he gave some homes multi-decade long license renewals. Absolutely shameful. Yeah. Speaker, why won't the Premier acknowledge that the mistakes of the previous Conservative government repeal Bill 60 and invest in our publicly funded publicly delivered, not-for-profit health care instead of the profits of pri private shareholders and CEOs. Thank you very much. Minister. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to unpack in that question from the member opposite. So he wants to talk about uh, long-term care. Well, let's talk about the legacy of what the last government, supported by the NDP, had done for the system. <laughs> Failing to build long-term care. They knew we had an Asian population. We have a lot of immigrants coming Order. to this province with seniors. That puts additional pressures onto a system, a system that they created in 15 years building net new 611 beds. Shame. Speaker, a system in which they let the wait list grow to 40,000 people. Shame. Speaker, a system in which the average wait time for seniors was 152 days. Shame. Speaker, it is under the leadership of this Premier and this former long-term care minister said that we're not going to go down that road, the road that they created where you don't support our seniors, because we think we need to take care of our seniors. Response. That's why we're building $10 billion record investment into building 58,000 new and redeveloped homes. That's why we are taking care of our seniors with better diagnostic tools, better outcomes, focusing on their health and well-being. Speaker, we won't take lessons from this NDP. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. So far, the federal Liberal government has increased the carbon tax on gasoline five times, and they plan on doing it seven more times over the next seven years. The carbon tax is making life more expensive for everybody, especially the trucking industry, who we rely on to transport our goods. That's why it was shocking to hear last week when the member from Canada Carleton actually stood up and defended the carbon tax. That Liberal member may think that, that the carbon tax is a good thing, but our government knows that it's a regressive tax and it only makes life more expensive for millions of people in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain the impact of the federal liberal carbon tax on the trucking industry. Response? Member for Brampton East and Parliamentary Assistance. Thank you, Speaker. I'm proud to represent the thousands of hardworking truckers in my riding. Every day they ensure our grocery stores' shelves are stocked and our hospitals have the equipment they need and our manufacturers have the resources they need to build Ontario-made products. But, Speaker, they tell me all the time the carbon tax adds unnecessary costs to each delivery. This only makes the cost of everything more expensive. According to the Ontario Trucking Association, the carbon tax of 17.4 cents per litre increases fuel costs for a long haul truck between $15,000 to $20,000 per truck per year. Speaker, it's clear that the carbon tax is hurting our economy and making life more expensive. We call on the federal government to do the right thing and get rid of the carbon tax. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I thank the parliamentary assistant for that answer. 
The people of Ontario are certainly indebted to the hard-working men and women in the trucking industry who deliver the essential goods that we count on every day. But, Speaker, the reality is that the impact of the carbon tax is having a bad impact on the trucking industry, and it ultimately affects every consumer. The cost to fuel the trucks to transport goods is passed on to the consumer who purchases those goods. This is a critical issue, and it impacts all Ontarians, including those who live in Canada Carleton, where over 1,500 people are employed in the trucking and warehousing industry. Unfortunately, the member for that riding is ignoring their concerns about the negative impact of this carbon tax. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please elaborate on how the carbon tax impacts the trucking industry and all Ontarians? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Essex from that, for that amazing question. Speaker, the NDP and the Liberals are so out of touch with reality right now. They claim that the carbon tax is design, designed to help people transi uh, transition to other options. Speaker, when it comes to long-haul trucking, there are no other options. The carbon tax is only a tax on the hardworking people who fill up their car, heat their homes, and rely on truckers to deliver their goods. I don't know when the last time the member from Canada Car Carleton actually met with a trucker. Speaker, I invite her to come, to come to Brampton and meet with the hardworking men and women who deliver our goods. They will tell her that the carbon tax is making it harder for families to put food on the table, and it's adding to inflation. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Ottawa Senate. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, uh, questions to the Premier. Yesterday was the World Day of Remembrance for Traffic Victims. I was honoured to attend the Toronto Ceremony Speaker, led by Jessica Speaker, who joins us in the Members' Gallery today, from family and friends for Safe Streets, who walked us through an Etobicoke neighbourhood, documenting hundreds of collisions that have caused serious injury or death to pedestrians and cyclists by reckless drivers. We can and we must act for change. After question period, Speaker, we can vote for Bill 40, the Moving Ontarians Safely Act. This legislation has been debated in this House for 10 years by different caucuses. It is not a partisan issue. Can the Premier confirm to the House today that the government will be supporting Bill 40 at second reading? Respond, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think uh, that we were uh, clear on that, that we would not be supporting it on, uh, on second reading. Uh, uh, having said that, Mr. Speaker, there was a, a number of uh, significant legislation that was brought in by the former, former Minister of Transportation with respect to uh, road safety uh, across the province of Ontario, and we'll continue to build on that. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And the supplementary question. So I, uh, I will say, Speaker, through you to the Premier and to the House Leader, that's a pretty disappointing answer. After 10 years of advocacy in this place, after members from every single political party in this House championing the exact words before this House in Bill 40. That is a very disappointing answer. Yes. It's a disappointing answer to the 3,066 pedestrians who were struck by reckless drivers in 2022. This is the government's own numbers. The 1,412 cyclists who were struck by reckless drivers. Speaker, 466 of those pedestrians were either critically injured or died. 135 of those cyclists were either critically injured or died. Is there, I ask the government through you, Speaker, an acceptable amount of road violence in our streets? The government's taken action around stunt driving. Yeah. They talk about safety a lot. But now Response. is their moment to justify to this House, with real words, why are you deciding to vote against Bill 40? Tell your government, tell yourselves this is the moment to stand for safety and vote for Bill 40. Please change your answer. Thank you. I remind the members to make their comments to the chair to reply. The member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member um, for that great question. Uh, Speaker, our government has done tremendous work to make sure that our roads stay safe. That's why we have some of the safest roads in North America. When we take a look at legislation introduced by our government, we take a look at the Moms Act and all of the wonderful things that came with that particular act. 
That was taking real action, Mr. Speaker, on ensuring that our roads continue to stay safe. Like I said to the member opposite um, in debate earlier, that our door is always open to take good ideas. But the proposed idea that's been given to the ministry, uh, order, vulnerable labeling vulnerable road users, Speaker, that is left up to the court so they can make the right decision based on each individual case. Each accident is different, and the court should have order. the power to make that determination, not a blanket legislation that's going to take over and then label all of them into one particular category speaker we'll be introducing more legislation speaker in the, in the coming months but our government is committed to ensuring that we have the safest roads in north america and we're open to taking all ideas because it's a non-partisan issue thank you speaker next question the member for thornhill thank you mr speaker my question is to the associate minister of small business Small businesses contribute significantly to Ontario's economy. However, the carbon tax is making it more difficult for many small businesses to, to survive. That's why it was so shocking to hear last Thursday that the member from Canada Carleton rose in this House to defend the federal carbon tax. The member claimed that the vast majority, the vast majority of households in Ontario are better off with a price on carbon. Speaker, the reality is that no one is better off because of the carbon tax. With over 6,000 retail trade employees working in Canada Carleton alone, many of these businesses and their workers feel this regressive carbon tax is negatively impacting them. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how the carbon tax impacts small businesses across Ontario? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Thornhill for the question and for advocating so passionately for job creators in her riding. Speaker, I've had the privilege of hearing directly from entrepreneurs across the province, and maybe the member from Kanata Carlton should do the same in her riding. Time and time again, they express real concern about the burden of rising costs from the federal carbon tax, combined with the upcoming deadlines like SIBA loan repayments. The carbon tax inflates expenses at every step of the supply chain. Whether they're farmers producing food, manufacturers leveraging our skilled workforce, or shops anchoring our main streets, Ontario's job creators all agree this punitive tax hits hardest just as they're getting back on their feet. Many business owners have shared fears that it could help make them reduce staff, raise prices Response. or even shut their doors for good. Unlike the Liberals and NDP, our government is listening to entrepreneurs and we're taking action on affordability. We'd like them to join us in calling on Ottawa to scrap the carbon tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for standing up for small businesses owners across our province. So our government must continue to respect the importance of small businesses. We know that the carbon tax is harmful to their success. Speaker, cutting the carbon tax has been one of our top priorities since day one. Uh, in order for our small businesses to grow and thrive. And as our government works to make life more affordable for Ontarians, it's concerning that the member from Kanata Carleton is not supporting the small businesses in her riding. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on how our government continues to support small businesses in Ontario by fighting the federal carbon tax? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member for the question. Speaker, I am proud to be part of a government under Premier, Premier Ford's strong leadership who has, from the start, spoken out against this job-killing tax. Yes, Speaker, and I'm glad to see Premiers right across all political stripes join us in calling on the federal government to expand exemptions for the carbon tax to lessen the burden on consumers and job creators. Here, here. Every day I meet inspirational entrepreneurs who are pouring their hearts and souls into building something from nothing, providing jobs and hope. That's why we've been there with our million dollar investment in Futurepreneur Canada, which helps young entrepreneurs access financing, mentorship and resources to turn their bold ideas into thriving businesses. Response. Or Digital Main Street, which helps existing businesses create and enhance their online presence and generate job speaker. We've stepped up to the plate for small businesses. It's time. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. 
The member for Meskikawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. To the Premier. This is a critical, critical time of the year when Ontario's conservation officers are hard at work to deter, to deter unsafe hunting practices and protect wildlife. Conservation officers also investigate gruesome injuries and deaths that result from tragic hunting-related accidents and are responsible for laying charges in case of careless hunting. They are working in some of Ontario's most isolated locations with limited access to support and assistance from other enforcement agencies. But conservation officers are not classified properly or compensated fairly for the work they do, causing low morale and a retention crisis. My question. When will this government acknowledge the duties that conservation officers undertake and commit to reclassify them accordingly? The member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, at this time of year, especially during hunting season, conservation officers play an incredibly important role in the protection and management of Ontario's natural resources to ensure that residents and visitors to Ontario can safely enjoy the province's natural resources for generations to come. Conservation officers connect with over 200,000 natural resource users from over 50 locations across the province annually. And we heard from our partners that we need more boots on the ground. In response, we fulfilled our promise to create 25 new conservation officer positions. And that brings the total number of conservation officer positions to over 200 here in the province of Ontario. And during that posting, okay, the ministry received and reviewed nearly 4,000 applications for these highly sought after positions. Conservation officers are the front line, safeguarding our natural heritage. This important work has been ongoing in Ontario for 130 years and will continue. We will continue to support and they will continue to protect our important natural resources. Supplementary, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. I'm hearing a lot of lip service from the government side. In the meantime, morale continues to decline because experienced conservation officers are leaving the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry to take jobs where their pay actually matches their training and experiences. Conservation officers are paid up to $31,000 less than OPP officers, despite being held to the same standards of training. They have the same levels of risk and the responsibility to carry sidearms. With a stroke of the pen, the government could provide the reclassification of these workers that these workers have long deserved. Will this government recognize that the training and duties of conservation officers far exceeds their compensation and commit to reclassification? Member for Hastings, Lennox and Adams. Thank you, Speaker. Right. We are, of course, aware that OPSU and the employer are working on a classification review, and I'm actually quite confused by the idea that the NDP would support government interference in that process. But I also understand <laughs> that the director of our enforcement branch is part of the committee designed to review this classification. They will make sure that the work, the skills, the importance of the conservation officers are specifically addressed during this review. This government responded by creating new officer, new positions uh, to, to support these officers, and we will continue to value the work of our conservation officers and the continued effort to support them in any way we can. Next question, the member for Bradford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Mines. Mining is an essential part of the supply chain that we are building for electric vehicles and is a source of significant economic opportunity. For many northern communities, mining provides stable and good-paying jobs and brings prosperity to, re prosperity to regional economies. Unfortunately, Speaker, the opposition has voted against every action our government has taken to support the mining sector. Speaker, what's even worse is that the independent Liberals and the opposition NDP support the federally imposed carbon tax which harms this critical sector. While our government is taking urgent action, other members in this House are supporting a regressive tax which will hold back progress in expanding the mining sector. 
Speaker, can the minister please explain the impact of the carbon tax on Ontario's mining sector? Thank you. Minister of Mines. Thank you to the member from Brantford Brant for this very important question. Speaker, a U of T study shows that creating one new mines creates over $300 million increase with Ontario's GDP and creates approximately 2,000 jobs. That's why we want more mines, Speaker. But the carbon tax is threatening these opportunities to grow our economy, and the NDP and the Liberals support these, this, this disaster, disastrous tax. Shame. They support hiking up fuel costs for the exploration companies in my riding that are working out in the bush searching for new mines. They support hurting small businesses in Timmins by making it more expensive to get the drill leaks turning and ship the core samples in the labs around Ontario. They support make, making it more expensive for large mining companies to reinvest their opportunities and extend mine opportunities in their own ridings. Speaker, we need the opposition to join us in telling their friends in Ottawa to axe this tax. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. This regressive carbon tax impacts Ontario's mining competitiveness. According to the Mining Association of Canada, the minimum federal carbon tax is set to increase by $15 per ton per year until it reaches $170 per ton in 2030. Wow. At a time when our government has attracted investments that position Ontario to become the global leader in manufacturing every component of clean, zero-emission electric vehicles, the impact of the carbon tax will cause significant consequences. It is unacceptable that the independent Liberals and the opposition NDP continue to support the federal carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain the impact of the carbon tax on major job creators for our economy, like the mining sector? Thank you. <laughs> minister of Mines. Thank you to the member from Brantford Brant again for the very important question. I've said it many times, Mr. Speaker. There's no electric vehicle revolution without mining. Here, here. I was encouraged this past year when the feds followed our lead by creating their own critical mineral strategy to support the homegrown electric vehicle supply chain. But, Speaker, they can't have it both ways. You can't put a tax that will raise the cost of our minerals at a time when we are competing globally. Yet they are imposing a tax that ensures that every part, every part and process required to make electric vehicles is more expensive, especially our critical minerals. You heard it right, Speaker. The member opposite support the federal carbon tax that burdens the people and industries required to build EVs. Shamefully, that they should, that it's shameful that they support a tax that makes life more affordable for families and makes job-creating industries less competitive. It's time to axe this tax. Here, here. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.